Good morning, sunshines, and welcome to Point Loma Community Presbyterian Church, or PLCPC, for you that like acronyms, or Plick Pick, for those of you that just want to skip it all together. We are in our second week of our new series entitled Relentless Love, which looks at the book of Hosea and God's unending love for us. And if you remember what we read last week, whoo, man, it was crazy. So we're going to continue that this morning. I pray that you are able to open your hearts and receive his love today. Welcome to worship this morning. We are so glad that you've chosen to spend part of your week here with us. No matter where you're tuning in from, we hope that you feel the love of Jesus as we seek to grow deeper in faith and be a reflection of his love. One of the values here at PLCPC is to be an authentic community. And there are a couple of ways that we can live that out here online. One is to sign up when you attend church online. Living out authentic community means being known. And we would love to know who's here, who we're watching with, so that we can greet you and learn how we can continue to serve you. So once you're signed in, say hello and let us know where you're tuning in from. And another way is joining the coffee after service. 
This is a time where there's no agenda. We just get to know one another. Sometimes we talk about the sermon or other relevant things that are happening in our lives or the world. And we're trying to make this even easier for you to join this coffee time after service. So a button will pop up in the chat and you can click that button and a Zoom window will appear right on top of the page where you're watching the service. A button will pop up in the chat and you can click that button and a Zoom window will appear right on top of the page where you're watching the service on instead of having to click off to another um, browser. So we hope that you'll give that a try and we hope to see you there. Now another opportunity to be in community after service is to attend Debrief the Sermon. All are invited to join online each Sunday in January at 10.30 a.m. This is a great way to meet others and learn from other members in the church community and have a chance to unpack and personalize the morning sermon. So feel free to join in on any or all Sundays. The Zoom link is posted in the chat room online or you can reach out to Lynn Ziegenfuss for the link. Now we invite all adults to join our new adult discipleship class that begins this Tuesday, January 11th at 6 p.m., led by Evan Gratz, our Director of Community Life. Life in Rhythm is designed to empower you to establish healthy rhythms of discipleship and live out God's design at both work and within your family. This 10-week class will be held online via Zoom with some potential for in-person gatherings at some point in the future. Visit our website to register and get the Zoom link. And coming up next Sunday, we are again offering our Discover Our Community class. This two-part class is for anyone who's interested in learning more about PLCPC and what it means to be a member of the church. So whether you live here in San Diego or not, you can become a member. And this class is held via Zoom and goes from noon until 1.30. So visit the register page of our website to sign up and for more information. And finally today, with joy and excitement of the new year comes new leadership in the church. And we are thrilled this morning that at the 9 a.m. service to ordain and install our new class of elders and deacons. We ask that you would keep them in your prayers along with the returning elders and deacons as they lead us and discern God's plan for our PLCPC community and beyond. And now I invite you to open your hearts as we continue on in worship. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Holy God, how many moments have there been when I turned from you and your ways? How many hours have I spent worrying about my life? How many times have I given credit to someone 
other than you for the beauty of this world. How many? Too many to count. And yet, how many times have you given up on me? Zero. Thank you, God, for your unwavering grace. Forgive me for pushing your love away. Amen. Friends, as we turn our lives and our purpose and direction over to God's will this morning, might you find great joy in knowing that you are forgiven. Amen.
Well, my friends, today we are continuing in our series on the book of Hosea called Relentless Love. And today we are reading from Hosea chapter 2, starting with verse 2. Please follow along with me on the screen. Plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife and I am not her husband. That she put away her whoring from her face and her adultery from between her breast. Or I will strip her naked and expose her as in the day she was born. And make her like a wilderness and turn her into a parched land and kill her with thirst. Upon her children also I will have no pity because they are children of whoredom. For their mother has played the whore. She who conceived them has acted shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers. They give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. Therefore, I will hedge up her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. She shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them, and she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then she shall say, I will go and return to my first husband, for it was better with me then than now. She did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, and the oil, and who lavished upon her silver and gold that they used for Baal. Therefore I will take back my grain in its time, and my wine in its season, and I will take away my wool and my flax, which were to cover her nakedness. Now I will uncover her shame in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall rescue her out of my hand. I will put an end to all her mirth, her festivals, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her appointed festivals. I will lay waste her vines and her fig trees, of which she said, these are my pay, which my lovers have given me. I will make them a forest, and the wild animals shall devour them. I will punish her for the festival days of the Baals, when she offered incense to them and decked herself with rings and jewelry and went after her lovers and forgot me, says the Lord. Therefore, I will now allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. From there, I will give her vineyards and make the valley of Achor a door of hope. There she shall respond as in the days of her youth, as at that time when she came out of the land of Egypt. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God today. Gracious God, sometimes when we open your word, it is so disturbing, Lord, so not understandable, Lord, that we do not know your ways. We, we are confused sometimes by who you are. But Lord, we pray today that you might indeed open our eyes and our hearts to receive from this ancient prophet, because Hosea does indeed have much to speak to us today. And we ask this in your holy name. Amen. The book of Hosea and the story of Hosea's life is a fascinating one. If you remember from last week, if you were with us, we discovered that the prophet Hosea was asked by God to marry a known prostitute, Gomer, and then have children with her to teach the nation of Israel about how wide and deep God's love is by showing them the width and the depth of their sin. The three children of Gomer each were given prophetic names which spoke to the people what was going to happen to them if they didn't turn from their idolatry. Through the name Jezreel, the firstborn, we learn that Israel was going to be destroyed through great bloodshed. Through lo ru we learned that God would remove his mercy from them and give it to the southern kingdom of Judah. And through lo I, we learned that God would break his covenant with his people and would reject their belonging. But in a great reversal of sorts, Toward the end of chapter 1 last week, we discovered God continuing to draw the people of Israel closer to him, even as they spat in his face. God does the same for us in Christ Jesus. He continues to love us and accept us, 
But that doesn't mean our sin isn't serious, nor does it mean that our sin doesn't have consequences. And we see some of those consequences in our passage for today. See, in the opening verses of chapter 2, God is encouraging the children of Gomer to plead with their mother to change her ways, to beg her to wake up and to walk a different path. Gomer, of course, represents the northern kingdom of Israel. If she doesn't change her ways, there will be consequences for her sin. First, we discover she will be alienated as her husband will have no choice but to divorce her on the legitimate grounds of adultery. In the same way, if Israel continued in their pursuit of other gods, the Lord would have no choice but to cut them off. The idea that God would turn from his people was not even something being considered at this time in history. If you remember from last week, the northern kingdom under Jeroboam was experiencing an unusually prosperous season. They had convinced themselves that they were invincible. And this was in large part because they had misunderstood God's grace. Israel held fast to the covenant that God had made with them. God told them that he would be their God and they would be his people. And they felt strongly that their cultural heritage would keep God from abandoning them. As a result, they figured they could do whatever they want and God would have to extend his grace. God was bound to his promise. The problem with this logic, though, which we fall into as well, especially when we become spiritually complacent, when we cheapen grace, is it assumes that God has no choice but to be in relationship with us. And that, my friends, is absurd to consider. Of course God has a choice. Since grace is not earned by anything we do but lavished upon us without merit, grace can also be removed. And so even though God made a choice to bind himself to us through a new covenant in Jesus Christ, it doesn't mean there are not consequences to our sin, including God turning away during particularly sinful seasons. Sin not only alienates us from God, it also brings shame. Hosea says, I will strip her naked and expose her as in the day she was born. In some ancient cultures, when a husband divorced his wife for adultery, she would be paraded through the town, naked for everyone to see what she had done. She would be exposed. And sin, when laid bare, also exposes us. You see, we live in a culture that despises shame. In fact, in order to combat shame in our culture, we often go the other extreme by making shame popular. It's our way of normalizing our wrongdoings and our wrong intentions. If I, in our culture, wear my shame proudly, then it can't hurt me. If my pride is then accepted as a cultural norm, then it must not be sin. But that is backwards thinking. As shame can actually be a helpful emotion if it's addressed in the right way. We feel shame because we have missed the mark in some way. And feeling that emotion is equivalent to the pain that one feels when touching a hot stove. It has the potential to retract and to draw us back to God. A third result of sin, which we discover in this passage in Hosea, is dissatisfaction with life. Hosea says of his wife, I will make her like a wilderness and turn her into a parched land and kill her with thirst. Once the pleasure of our sin wears off, which it always does, 
we are left empty. In our culture, this explains why so many of us struggle with disillusionment and addiction and depression and anxiety. We go out of our way as a people to rationalize our turning away from God and God's way instead of being honest. And this results in a shallow, desolate existence. And finally, the fourth result of sin in this passage is the damage that it inflicts on others. Upon her children also I will have no pity, because they are children of whoredom, Hosea says. Our sin separates us from others, and it spreads, and then it infects We think we are hiding something. Our lives, we believe, are under control. When in reality, our pride, our inauthenticity, our selfish behaviors, and our disregard of God affect everything we do. How we parent our children. How we treat our own parents. How we interact with our colleagues. And what we bring to the table of our friendships. You see, sin is powerful. The temptation to turn our attention and affection toward other things other than God is powerful. It's powerful because it's often the path of least resistance. But what we discover, maybe you're discovering it right now, is sin also destroys everything that we hold dear. In May 1980, Mount St. Helens in Washington State erupted. Maybe some of you remember that. Now, even though it was viewed as a surprise, it was not a sudden event. For two months prior to the massive blast, earthquakes and volcanic activity signaled a major event that was underway. Authorities had plenty of time to sound the alarm and warn those living nearby of the looming danger. Yet despite the seriousness of the threat, some people chose to disregard the warnings. Probably the best known of those who refused to evacuate was a man by the name of Harry R. Truman. This 83-year-old man was the owner and caretaker of the Mount St. Helens Lodge at Spirit Lake. He had survived the sinking of his ship in World War I, and he was not about to leave just because scientists thought there was danger. Truman told reporters, I don't have any idea whether it will blow, but I don't believe it to the point that I'm going to pack up. Well, on May 18, 1980, Truman and his lodge were buried beneath 150 feet of mud and debris from this volcanic eruption. And his body was never found. In the same way as this story, it is foolish to continue in our sin and idolatry and think that we will somehow be exempt from the consequences. But you see, even in Hosea chapter 2, we see God's grace and love being imparted even in the face of unfaithfulness. For she said, I will go after my lovers. They give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. Therefore, I will hedge up her way with thorns and I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. This metaphor from Hosea comes from ancient times when walls made from thorns would be erected to prevent livestock from wandering off. You see, in the same way, God will put boundaries on the paths of Israel so they will not be able to sin so easily. You know, I'm sure Israel did not see these boundaries as a positive thing, being thwarted from getting the ease that they wanted. But in fact, God's choice to put boundaries is a gracious act of love. And that's hard for us particularly some of us that are listening today to accept, as as we've been taught that saying no is a bad thing. But in fact, saying no to sin, to the easy way out, to the temptation, to the belief that we can do it on our own, 
means that we can say yes to God. In fact, saying no to ourselves and others in our culture has almost become synonymous with hatred. But boundaries aren't about hate. They are about love. I love you. I love myself. I love God enough to not settle for something that brings pleasure in the moment and destruction in the long run. Interestingly enough, when Gomer fled from her husband to the bed of other men, her husband still provided for her. The text tells us she did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, and the oil, and who lavished upon her silver and gold that they use for Baal. Think about this situation. Hosea's wife has left him to sleep with other men, and he finds the home of these men, which would take some work, by the way, and decides to drop off groceries and money so she won't be left destitute. He opens up a bank account for her, and she gives credit to her lovers. We as a people, I suspect, look at this act and consider it pathetic. Get it together, Hosea. Get a backbone. But then God connects this pathetic act to his own faithfulness and love for us. It's humiliating and it's disgraceful. But that's how much God loves us. Yet God is not weak, as you might read through this metaphor. This lavishing is a choice born out of God's strength. And that's why when God punishes Israel, that is also an act of love. I will punish her, Hosea says, for the festival days of the Baals when she offered incense to them and decked herself with her ring and jewelry and went after her lovers and forgot me, says the Lord. When we go through painful and difficult seasons, as much as we don't like to think about God in this way, sometimes that is an act of God's discipline to call us back to him. When we begin as a people to love the gifts of God more than the giver, God's love may indeed look and feel painful in our lives. But this this punishment, it isn't sadistic. It is grace. It is God saving us from ourselves. As Hosea tells us, God ultimately wants to make the valley of Accor a door of hope. Now the valley of Accor was a place well known in the story of Israel, which we read about in Joshua chapter 7. After entering into the promised land, we all know that story, and after the fall of Jericho, Achan, one of the Israelites, decided to steal from the treasure of the Lord and hide it in his house. He thought he was getting away with something. And this act, it caused the Israelites, the entire Israelites, the whole nation, to lose their favor from God. But the Lord revealed that act to Joshua through a series of events, and Achan and his family were stoned to death in the valley of Accor to atone for their sin and to set things right for the Israelites. One man died for his own sin so that God's judgment would not be taken out on the entire community. And now in Hosea, God says, I will make that valley which your history speaks of in a shameful way, no longer shameful, but a door of hope where another man will die, not for his own sin, but for yours, so that God's judgment will not be taken out on this world. And in this prophecy, we see God's love expressed in an unfathomable way, which we will ultimately discover in Jesus Christ. And so now, because of that cross, we don't have to be alienated from God. We don't have to live in shame. We don't need 
to be dissatisfied with our lives and, and damage the lives of others. We have the cross. We have Jesus Christ. We have the relentless love of God which leads us beyond our sin. But here's the kicker. We must learn to submit to that love and not keep running away. That's the challenge, my friends. To trust God more than we trust ourselves. Amen.
Well, I'm not sure where each of you are at this morning, both geographically or uh, inside your heart and on your journey with the Lord, but wherever you are, know that it's okay to be there and that you're around others in community. And might we have that in mind this morning as we picture our Lord as we go to prayer. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you for the opportunity to gather this morning. We thank you uh, for the remembrance that we're not alone, that we're amongst other believers, God, and that you are present. Father, so many things going on in the lives of each one of us, the things that uh, we might boldly speak about and the things that go unspoken, but we are assured that you know each one of those situations intimately, that you've seen them coming and you know the outcome. We ask for that supernatural uh, healing this morning, Lord, in the, the ways that only you can provide. We ask for a hope in the midst of chaotic situations, and we ask for calm in the midst of whatever storm might be taking place. God, we continue to seek you in everything that we do, and we continue to celebrate uh, your son's birth. As we journey into this new year, might we journey into new ways of understanding your will in our lives, and might we find uh, an extra purpose in that, not just for who we're going to be in the future, but what purpose might you have for us each and every day. I pray that we would wake up with great anticipation every morning, God, in anticipation of knowing that we're going to learn more about who you are. So Lord, in a hurting world, might we just see everything through your lens and through your eyes and find joy, even in the darkest places. This morning, Father, we do remember that we are not alone as we come together and speak the words that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. There are so many things that we can be thankful for. There are so many things going on in the life of our church and within our community, and for that, uh, might we find an excessive amount of joy in participating in that. One way that we can do that is through our giving this morning. Might it be an act of worship, and out of no obligation, freely we have received. So now freely, let us give.
now, my friends, as you leave here today, may the love of God flow through you. May God's love work in you. And may God's love be the channel of grace for everyone that you meet in this world. And we ask this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. It's great to be with you in worship today. How many of you out there have relationships in your life, whether it's a friendship or a marriage relationship or work relationships, whatever? I don't know if you notice that in your relationships, to experience the fullness of those, there have to be boundaries in those relationships. And just kind of what Carla was talking about, for us to experience the fullness of God's love and His grace in our lives, sometimes He sets boundaries around us not so that he can uh, confine us, but so that we can fully experience him. And so that's an interesting tension I was thinking about in listening to Carla this morning. Uh, but I invite you to click on the Zoom link for virtual coffee where we have an opportunity to talk about that and other things and to be together in community and to get to know one another beyond just simply the text chat or just watching the screen. Or if you want to get past all the chit chat and go right to talking about the sermon specifically with other people from the community, you can join the Zoom link that's popping up right now in the chat. If you would like to learn more about the church or about how you can grow deeper in relationship with God and others here at PLCPC, we are going to ask you to fill out the connection form that's also popping up in the chat. That's a lot of stuff popping up in the chat, but just it goes debrief the sermon connection form. So we would love to meet you. And if we can serve you in any way, please reach out to us at melissa at pointlomachurch.org. Or if you want to talk to the guy here, you can talk to Aro at pointlomachurch.org. Either way, we want to hear from you. Have a great week, and we look forward to seeing you next Sunday. Mm -hmm.